myself, I'm a vice president for research at one of the 120 or so universities that have that uh, role in the United States. Um, and although I could have a very uh, interesting uh, and extended philosophical discussion about the place of organization in, in, uh, um, in U.S. universities, the role of faculty, the difficulties that that role implies, I spend most of my time sort of leveraging and um, attempting to facilitate or, or uh, reinforce the notion that many academic uh, researchers and, and uh, professors in U.S. research universities have that they don't have a boss and that they aren't working for someone as, a, as part of the labor force. That's a philosophical kind of conception that most people at my university walk around with every day, even though sometimes they're confronted with other realities about being an employee of a big institution. <laughs> but as a, as a research leader, I'm, I'm really trying to promote that kind of independent notion of being my own, uh, my, my own boss at the university. Uh, now, one of the things that, this is the abstract that turned in, I want to make very clear that I am not a leadership guru. Uh, I'll start with a cartoon here, so very, very quickly. I'm, I'm reading a, a, a great management book about the rules of leadership, says Pointy-Haired Boss. I looked it up. That's actually his name, Pointy-Haired Boss, in the Dilbert cartoon. Uh, and Dilbert says, allow me to put that in context. There are probably 10,000 books about leadership, and each one has a different approach. And there are millions of real leaders of which no two are alike. Moreover, every situation is unique and requires a different type of leaders, and yet this one author has found the magic formula to transform you from a gullible baboon into a great leader. And that makes sense because all great leaders throughout history achieve success by reading a random book. <laughs> and Pointy Haired Boss says, I don't like context. Thank you very much. You didn't, you just didn't very much. So I'm not here to tell you some great secrets, and, and I, but I am here to tell you how I think about leadership. And there's a reason to think about leadership if you're trying to be a leader. One is if you're not very good at it, uh, and I can embrace that. But another is if you want to try to help someone else learn it as a skill. Then you need, to, even if you're a natural leader, it's a different thing to try to help someone else think about it. So I began thinking about this when being asked to come talk to faculty groups in different groups around campus that are wanting to be more intentional about their leadership development. So if you're, if, so a lot of this is structured as if it's a, a workshop on leadership, although I'll, I'll be much more rapid than I would be in that kind of context. But the critical question is not can I be a leader, but who do I want to lead and toward what? Well, Comrade Lorenz in that. I mean, leadership is not just leadership, right? Who do I want to lead and toward what? So another way to phrase the desire is I want to play the role of leader in the lives of some particular persons so that together we might achieve some particular goal. And that's, that's the way I want to think about leadership. It's very contextualized, very personal in the sense of in a world relationship. And here we have the notion of a natural versus assumed role. And again, I think that some people feel that they are natural leaders. Some people look at others and say, oh, they're just natural leaders. But we all have different roles in, in our lives that feel more or less natural and others that, that we simply assume or we we develop the capacity to function in that role. So this is one of the one of the concepts here that I'm really talking about is role theory from within uh, a constructivist perspective. So when I think of social role and when I talk about social role and the role of leader with others, I really talk about it as that sum total set of anticipations or imaginations, if you will, about the expectations of important others in a given context. I love the little cartoon on the right. I really hate it when the voices in my head argue among themselves as if I wasn't in the room. Uh, but, but we do have these voices, if you want to use that as a, as a metaphor, or, or, or conceptions within us about the expectations of important others. So in order to understand a, a, a given role, we need to know that relevant context. We need to know what the character is trying to do. So, you know, I've done a little acting. When you think of character analysis and, and things that we got directly from Kelly but using this same metaphor. And then who are the important others whose expectations count? So when I think of the role of leader for myself, I ask myself those same questions. What's the relevant context? And that includes 
who are those people that I'm that I that I'm intending to put myself in role relationship with as leader, implying there's some following cohort. What's the goal? And who are those important others whose expectations matter to me in defining my role of leader? Knowing all the while that these things are transient, they will change over time, change as I go. So the context, what's my context? Well, again, doing this, thinking about this with, with a group of profession, professionals at, uh, at my university, helping them think about are they wanting to be a leader in their profession, in their program, in their college, their department, the university as a whole. And who's the target of my leadership? Faculty, students, staff, alumni, donors, some combination of those, some on one day, some on another, because those different targets of that leadership will change how I conceive of that role. And then what's my goal? What am I trying to lead my followers toward? And I know sometimes we're very much encouraged to get very specific and, and targeted with our goals. Um, but I ask the question in this context, in the context of leadership, is bigger better or is more specific better? And this could be the topic of a whole conversation perhaps, but I really started out with Norman Vincent Peale's notion here with the more you lose yourself in something bigger than yourself, the more energy you have. And in the context of university leadership and all the vagaries and complexities and demands of people's lives, I think it's very important to have a lofty goal. It is actually a lofty charge that we have in higher education. You were saying the key profession, well, we're, we're really trying to change the world in what we do, whether it's in our research or in our instruction. And so have, being invested in a lofty goal is very strong. So my, my personal goal as the Vice President for Research at Oklahoma State University is to elevate the research at my university so that we're known far and wide as a comprehensive uh, land-grant university that are making discoveries that matter to people in the state of Oklahoma and around the world. Fairly lofty goal. I can scale that down on any particular day and think about what I'm trying to do today or what I'm trying to do with what any particular activity. But I encourage people in leadership roles to invest themselves in a big goal, not just the specifics. And who are those important others whose expectations matter to me in defining my role? You know, if I succeed in being a good leader, whose eyes are looking down on me in approval? And likewise, whose eyes would be looking down on my failure with discipline? You know, we can get into these things personally. I could, I could share with you some stories about my own life, but one of the things that I really uh, focus on here is the self-analysis or any of the, is any, any part of that makeup of my psychological audience problematic, such that it creates conflict in my own functioning and role. And if so, can that change? You know, is it overly demanding? I have a wonderful relationship with my father, so I'll, I'll make it up with you guys. The overly demanding taskmaster task master, uh, attitude of, of one's father, you know, looking over my shoulder all the time and creating unrealistic expectations. If, if you have a problematic component to that psycholo psychological audience, can it change? And I would say yes, but it's work. It involves learning about other leaders, mentorship, talking it out, if you will. I'm going to talk to mostly psychologists here, so I don't think that's any surprise when you think about changing that. That, uh, that psychological audience or at least the, the strength of the voices in that audience, self disputation task. It's all about choices, defining my leader role. And here I want to talk just a little bit about a, a tool I've, I've been playing with. It's really a, a simplified version of a role construct task. Where if we, if we think about a, um, if you think about the, the old role, role construct task that was stopping short of doing the entire repertory grid, but taking a variety of roles or, or elements and deriving constructs, this is thinking specifically of the leader role. And call this the leadership value dimension map, just to have a place to uh, uh, turn to it. This is very much focusing on the singular role of leader. So asking the person to list some characteristics of a leader that they've either known themselves or read about. Then write down the opposite of that characteristic. Identify the poll that they view as the most positive attribute. And then indicate the, the relevance of that dimension in their current leadership context. And then placing themselves along that leadership value dimension. 
So it's very recognizable as a, as a kind of a vector of a, of a role construct task. I did this for myself just as a, a, a way to uh, initiate the exercise with people that I work with at OSU. And I, I, I have some of those, those dimensions here, charismatic versus boring, fair versus capricious, strategic versus one size fits all, authoritarian and inclusive, thin skin, scrappy. Oh, you got the idea. So, so these different kinds of dimensions that I didn't have a value on one way or the other. And I'll come back to this one, but I, I noticed in my own, like, at least a potential at a conceptual level conflict, where I have this fair versus capricious uh, dimension, where I very much value fair, and then I have this strategic versus one size fits all, and I very much value strategic. So I at least see the potential for there to be a, uh, a, a little conflict at times between being strategic and not just being the same for in all contexts and for all people versus being fair as, as opposed to capricious. So that's, that's a part of what we look for in these different value dimensions. And then plan some enactments. How would I, how would I carry this out? Including managing those conflicts. But of course, we can all sit in a room like we're doing today, and we can plan on being a leader. But until we actually go out and do that in action, it's a little hard to, to, to break it apart and know where, where it's working and where it's not. So this is where self-monitoring comes into place. How am I doing? Can I look back at my preferred polls? Am I being strategic? Am I being fair? Am I being calm versus reactive? Am I staying in role? Or am I losing it at times and going into how I, how I react when I'm just with, uh, with colleagues within my own profession or when I'm with my family and it's not the same role as a leadership role or when I'm more being in my employee role. Is my role changing? Am I changing? Am I okay with those changes? Remember all these things are going to change. So if anyone talked about the, the value dimension map as being a psychological self, it's kind of where I am right now and how I'm how I'm construing my leadership role right now, but am, as that's changing, are those changes that I can value and embrace, or are those deviations from my goal? The context monitor. This is probably the most difficult thing for my own, my own development, is what avenues of leadership enactment and goal pursuit does my current context facilitate? I can, I can be the greatest leader of all time in theory, but when I put it into that context, are there some avenues of pursuit that are more afforded by that context than others? And what avenues does my context impede or block? Of course, that context can include other people, just as, as well as some other contexts. Social partner monitoring. How am I being viewed? The sociality corollary is very important here. Uh, to the extent that I'm anticipating another person's construct system, but I, as leader, am, am, am an element in their, in their social sphere now. How am I being viewed? What roles or goals does this person have to either facilitate or block mine? And then, as part of that social uh, partner monitoring, I, I share this with people. This is a, a, a rule of thumb, a heuristic that I think is uh, not necessarily accurate to the numeric level, but it's a, it's a useful way, I think, for people who want to lead in a complex environment to think about. If 10% of my potential social partners are avid followers, like they're bought in, they're with me, and I can work the, the context such that no more than 10% are avid blockers, then the middle 80 plus percent will shift in the direction of the avid followers. Now, I actually believe this is true in most social contexts. I, even if I had data to suggest that it's not true, it's still a more uh, a functional framework to operate from as a leader. You, can, you can't get everyone to follow. You can't keep everyone from being a blocker. Um, so in order, to, uh, in, in order to keep that mindset of positive movement, uh, it's, it's, it's a good framework to work with. And then goal monitoring. Right? We headed in the desired direction. Does my goal need to change? Is it too lofty? Is it in a direction that's no longer affordable? Role comfort. You know, I don't want to be a fake leader. I don't want to just be someone who acts like a leader. 
I want to be a leader. I want to be a real leader. And so if I'm, if I'm breaking this all down, I'm mapping it out, I'm setting up these dimensions and saying, well, I have to be this, that, and the other. When will all this feel more natural to me? I, I suspect some of you remember some of the work that uh, Trevor Butt and I think did you do this with Deb Burke? I'm not sure, but remember they looked at, at the, um, the, the subjective sense of being oneself. When people, when people say, I'm, I don't really feel like I'm being myself right now, what, is, what, the, what does that mean? And when people say, oh, I really feel like myself, what, what does that mean? What's the context distinction? So when a leader is being him or herself as a leader, their research suggested that it's when we're enacting a role. It's not that, we're, that, that we've gotten out of enacting a role. We, and, and we start with this framework. We're always in some role or another or multiple ones. It's not that we're not doing that. We are enacting a role, but that it's so self-practiced that that self-monitoring operates without a lot of effort. We're able to monitor our functioning within that role without a lot of conscious effort. That's when we feel like we're ourselves. So just about any new task that we take on, we're going to feel that artificiality for, for a period of time. And I think it's important to realize that a task like leader, unless you just are an absolute natural leader, where that self-monitoring is effortless, as long as you're trying to consciously do this, there's going to be a certain sense of artificiality, at least at first. So it's all about practice. So I do think that constructive psychological principles, tools that have proven, at least to me, equally useful as a vice president for research as they were as a psychology professor or psychotherapist. And God, if you start with a Dilbert, you've got to finish with a Dilbert. So point here, man says, experts say I can appear charismatic by setting high expectations. Dilbert says, or maybe you could improve your charisma by fixing your character flaws instead of making me work harder. <laughs> Pointing here, man. No, I'm fairly sure the problem with my charisma is on your end. <laughs> so again, I am no guru. These are how I think about leadership when I'm uh, attempting to enact my own role as a university leader, and how I've attempted to break that down using some of these constructivist concepts to communicate them to others. Um, and I'm very aware that positions of power obscure feedback um, regarding leadership effectiveness. So it's very, it's very likely that uh, the kind of feedback I get in my social environment as a university is not exactly as accurate as, as I might wish it to be. Thank you. Any questions, comments, Bill? No, I have some comments from the perspective of a blocker. Um, I started at university when I was real university, so I was in scholarship for the same sake. Uh, and I left as a life member of the trade union, which I was just a local branch president of for a long time. And so I, I wrote a paper called On the Vacuous Concept of Leadership, or Academic Leadership, and based around the concept that there is no such thing as leadership. There are leaders that the man that rescues his troop in Vietnam and gets them off to safety when the officer was shot, couldn't run a paper shot, he couldn't run it. But he just was a leader, and that was his time. But he's come back, you know, he's a drunk, and he keeps losing his jobs. So, leader as a generic concept, like creativity is a generic concept, it doesn't exist. You're creative in science, you're creative in art, but you can't be creative in a general sense. So, mm -hmm. but what's the university deteriorate in the fundamental <coughs> what they do as framing, they have carrying it over to the businesses? John Dewey was writing in the 1930s that had businesses and we destroyed the university. So what this paper said was we advertised some of the research leadership to do that when someone was published a lot of papers. And that would be a good barometer. And the leadership would be set an example to colleagues. So I publish more papers than you, so you book your game. So that, that's the context in which I come. So the whole concept of leadership is a real puzzle to me. And so in the paper, I went with the anarchists and said, we don't want leaders, we want managers good managers, mm -hmm. and that says it what it is. It's a business manager. Leadership's for the back of your sponsor to universities and my people. So maybe there's a question in there. Yeah, well, maybe I mean, it's just a yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that we're in much disagreement at a philosophical level. Uh, certainly the, the, the state of higher education, um, I believe in Australia, very much like the United States is having developed a business model, and we have done this thing where we put 
uh, people like myself who, as uh, my, many of my psychology department colleagues refer to me as having gone to the dark side, uh, moving into administration, that I, I have a very dual role of a manager and a leader. So I'm a, I'm a boss of a certain sector of the university's administrative, administrative structure, but I'm also expected to elevate them certain aspects that I have no direct power over, and, and if I'm going to influence them at all, it has to be at that leadership level as I've defined it here today. Um, but I, I also have been at a university where um, I've had people at that top level, and I'm really referring to presidents and vice presidents here at, at my university, who were more or less effective managers but very dramatically different in how they related the, the loftier goals and related to the faculty in their pursuit of those loftier goals, uh, some of which were very bad at that. And the, it, the, the, the morale dip at that university was palpable. And some of which that were really good at that and maybe weren't even really good at some of the more basic management things, but you saw an energy come to the faculty. So it's not a philosophical argument, it's more of a practical argument. So that, yes, I'm gonna run the, re the research services operation in my university, and yes, I'm gonna run the research compliant and manage those things, um, but I also want to be part of a positive research culture at my university. And that's how I think about the leadership pieces, not so much that those successes are attributable to me. So I, 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 I think I agree with you in lots of ways, but at the same time, there is there is a spot for managers that have a negative relationship with the, the culture at a university. And I, I'm thinking about leadership as being intentionally trying to have a positive culture. Yeah, well, the, truth, yeah. the, the magazine of the Union in Australia had a headline on the current issue. It's called The Advocate. And it had Australian universities ranked top in the world and then dot, dot, dot in vice chancellor's salaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What rewards do you get? I often heard that the higher up someone is in the hierarchy, the less positive feedback they get. Um, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> what rewards do I get? The, uh, I think that you, you have circles of, uh, just like with any, any, any world, you have circles of, uh, of communication. And there are some of those closer circles where the positive feedback is very, very intensely rewarding. And then, but it's also where negative feedback can be most useful and, and received. And for, for, for me, the, the rewards that come like from the, the, the public looking level, like something that the president might say or our board of regents and so forth about the research at the university, I, I, don't, I don't experience those as very reinforcing. Um, but but I, I, sus I suspect that's very individual. And, and but as, as, as you say, as, as Bill says, it's also, you know, at a very pragmatic level, it's, it's, it's one of the few ways in American universities to, uh, uh, particularly from, uh, from certain professional backgrounds like psychology, uh, or like in the colleges of education and social sciences and humanities, to, uh, to elevate one's, um, pay status beyond a very real ceiling in uh, many of our fields. So there's, I mean, I, I don't deny the, the rewards associated with, uh, with, with that, but I mean, it's very different than kind of the social rewards, positive feedback. I, I, do, I do occasionally have someone come to me, I mean, just the other day, someone came to me who knew I had truly advocated for a young faculty member who um, was in a department with a, with a toxic culture that young faculty member was coming up for tenure and the department was really against tenuring that uh, that young that young faculty member and I, I I worked with the provost and kind of convinced the provost to even go against his own dean's uh, recommendation so that we kept this young faculty member and, and a, a, another senior faculty member came to me and had somehow heard that I had you know, advocated on his behalf and just expressed that appreciation. And I, I, I feel that more deeply than anything that comes out in a magazine or a report about the university. Mm -hmm. Everyone? Yes, I'm struck by the last point you made about 
um, you know, not really getting um, honest feedback. And I just keep thinking, oh, it is lonely at the top. But it can be lonely at the top, I guess. And I guess I wonder, I mean, thinking about more relationships, is there a way that you have found that has worked so that, I mean, it sounds like for you as a leader, it's really important for you to kind of understand how the people you are leading are thinking and feeling and making sense of their jobs and other people and coworkers and things like that. Is there anything that you can do that fosters that moving in the other direction? I guess from your, your, your um, employees to kind of gain an understanding of you so that there could be more reciprocity? No, I, I, I do think that there's a certain amount of you know, being willing to humanize yourself um, and even to talk about things like this and to um, to use self examples of, of, of what's working and what's not and how I mean I, I, I in this very context I talk about blocker you know, there's, there's there's a colleague who is actually organizationally right on the same level as me um, but I I view him as actually quite powerful and, and potentially dangerous to me um, and he views me as a threat so that's a problem um, and I've been there a year and a half when I finally realized some of the key aspects in, in trying to neutralize this, this this threat and not make him feel threatened by me. And so having admitted to some colleagues who kind of knew the situation, but admitting to them that, you know, I just had an aha experience. I've been I've been doing this all wrong for a year and a half. I, I, I feel like the, that kind of humility is not the right word, but you know, just, just honest self-reflection and sharing your, your your struggles with people, they don't have to be down to the nitty-gritty level, um, tends to make people see you as, as someone who, even if you even if they don't like the particular thing you did, they can say, well, I think he's on our side. I think he's he's trying to move us in a positive direction. I, I do get some, some nice feedback in that regard. Yeah? I just wonder if you have thoughts about the difference between someone who is a leader by choice or if they are forced into a position and they're a leader by default. Not that it has anything to do with me. Um, <laughs> would, you, would your information and would your feedback change? Um, I, think, I think what's, what's different is if you, if you are intentional about the, the, the social sphere of the, of the potential followers. Because there, there are certainly people that are thrust into a leadership role, and they really don't don't believe that they want followers. They just have people saying, "We want you to lead," and that I think that changes how you how you think about that role relationship. Whereas I'm actually trying to recruit followers, not in the sense of, "Hey, look at me, I'm somebody great," but that I need the followers in order to reach the goal. And where the, the, the recruited leader is often someone who's already completely invested in the goal, and they're just being asked to take on a different kind of social status in regard to their peers. So I, they don't tend to be I mean, I, I, all I could think of when you said the famous uh, the, the famous line of the the, uh, of the professional basketball player now turned uh, commentator Charles Barkley says, "You know, I'm not a role model." Well, you don't get a pick when you're in certain kinds of social context, right? People are looking up to them, and so when you're behaving in a certain way and, and people are criticizing you, it's because you've been thrust into that role. And that's really different than when you're trying to recruit the followers. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I think the very best administrator at Temple University was at Temple University that he became president at uh, George Mason, I think. George, a guy named George Johnson, who was dean of uh, liberal arts. Um, his motto was, don't try to defend the indefensible. Hmm. And he never did defend the indefensible. You know, he'd come to the department and the faculty would say, our offices are too small. And he'd say, absolutely. Uh, and the other thing he did is he uh, he established a, talking about a fellowship, he, established a personal relationship with virtually everybody. Um, and one of our young faculty members had an occasion one day to escort a job candidate over to the dean's office. Uh, and his job
discovered so he did deposit them at the dean's office and then he left and later that day he got a, a call from from uh, dean johnson saying uh, apologizing saying he had forgotten to thank her for bringing the candidate over mm -hmm. Herb hadn't seen this as an affront in any way, but he remembered that incident for the next, I don't know how many years, yeah. because the dean went out of his way to say, uh, I, I should have thanked you. Yeah, the, uh, the offices are too small. One of the uh, had a faculty co colleague that went to the department chair once um, who uh, had complained about the, the limited amount of space that we had. So, Instead of saying, I'll go back to your office and be satisfied with what you've done, he actually created what he called brought this concern to business. And he created this index of the number of uh, publications per square foot of allocated <laughs> space and took that to the dean. <laughs> to to make the point on the on behalf of the entire faculty of how productive these faculty were with this paltry paltry amount of space. So yeah, it's interesting. So yeah, not affinity. Well, and the contrast to Dean Johnson was another dean who I didn't believe the faculty members who said they were using various pieces of space and put threads had security put threads across to see if the door was had been opened and there were people who were indeed going in or out of these spaces. A little different. Yeah, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to chat with anybody as we go. Thank you.